Oppenheimer is making a blast and is at least leading in the critical and audience reception by a tiny amount. But it can't hold a candle to the box office run from Barbie. But is the film actually as good as everyone is saying? So, let's talk about that. I'm Lachlan, this is Ewan, and we're going to give you our non-spoiler thoughts on the Nolan biopic of J. Robert Oppenheimer. The so-called, well not so-called, he definitely would be the father of the atom bomb. He is, he's little daddy atom bomb. I did just say that. Uh, you'll find a spoiler review in this week's uh, podcast that we do um, for both Barbie and Oppenheimer. Without further ado, let's get into the film and talk about it. Did this swirlwind of a biopic that also does non-linear storytelling like we are used from Nolan work for you, Lachlan? Yeah, it took me a little bit to get into how it was telling the film. Uh, luckily, uh, yeah. when you watch Memento, you kind of go, oh, he's doing black and white and colour, which means two different timelines. So any Nolan yeah. fans will kind of understand what's going on. But it's a less... It's in the lore. Yeah, it's less It's less timeline-esque. Uh, it obviously takes place in the future with the black and white, but it's a bit more of a different perspective. That's how I kind of saw it at first. It Because you see a lot mm -hmm. of the same scenes uh, in black and white and in colour. And it's yeah. basically whether it's told from the perspective of Oppenheimer or whether it's told from the perspective of a different character, uh, that character being Robert Downey Jr.'s character, who's the, the, the yeah, main... Strauss. Yeah, Strauss, the main uh, black and white, I guess, protagonist in, in the black and white uh, sections of this film. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I felt like this film rocked the non-linear editing and mm -hmm. it there's sort of like three distinctive sections of this film there's sort of the introduction yeah. to Oppenheimer there's the the race to create the a-bomb and then there's the courtroom drama that kind of wraps up the end of the film and whilst I think that the majority of the film was quite solid uh you and I want to get it out in the open and get it out of the way I think this film's just a tad bit too long. I feel like it would Agreed. have worked yeah. if it was a little bit shorter. Uh, but I I didn't dislike it as much as other long films. And I'm like, ah, oh, this film's too long. It could have been better if it was shorter. I just feel like yeah. there was parts that felt like they took too long to conclude. And it would have been a mm -hmm. bit nicer if it was a bit more tight-nipped and wrapped up quite quickly, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on the runtime? I think overall this movie is really tight in its, its pacing, the way it jumps around, and I feel like it does a great job at keeping you up to speed of, like, I, I love the little cut-ins of, like, certain characters that were reintroduced to give us kind of context. Like, you could definitely leave this out and you would be lost. So by the end of it, with the huge runtime, I wasn't expecting to get, like, a third act that was not as much feeling like a third mm. act as long as i had gotten it for and this movie is way more uh about this is not not a spoiler I, I would consider it uh way more about like also the legacy of oppenheimer as much as it is about like the race to build the atomic bomb and i feel like you need to do that uh to i, I guess gift is a complete biopic so it's not just dramatizing a really horrendous you know uh change for the rest of history uh as like up uh, as like um nolan says himself he he thinks oppenheimer might be the the most important uh, most important person to ever live and he certainly makes that argument in this film as well but at the back end i just wasn't as engaged with what it was focusing on because it, it does tend to like you said like the protagonist becomes a robert donny jr's characters a bit more if he's good or not that's you know, that's what get, what's uh, unfolded and told in, in that last section. But I just didn't really care as much. But by the end, it justified it for me. There was like some kind of emotional resolution that I got out of it. Although like, yeah, I did have certain moments where I was like, I, d I don't need this. Certain storylines for certain characters were a bit disappointing. Like I, I think Nolan always struggles to write women in an interesting way. And I feel like it's at a peak here. Uh, the three women who actually like are in the story. Uh, I just like they did not working for me um at all, unfortunately. But um yeah. It's it's a long film, but I look, I can't complain because I was invited to a press screening of like an IMAX thing here in Switzerland. And 
like I, I was I was there with uh, with Kelly, uh, our co-host who was most recently in our, in our bracket that we did for all of Nolan's films. Go check that out. But we had like reclining VIP seats mm -hmm. and we got free snacks and ever, everything. Like I had probably one of my I would say top three maybe top five but maybe even top three cinema experience of all time for this film um uh, so uh, maybe like if you experience it in in the right way uh the three hours actually kind of fly by as well there, there was no question back to you Lachlan uh what do you what do you want to add to the film uh to our review here I think you nailed it I agree with all the comments that you just said I also yeah. had reclining seats and everything where I was didn't get free snacks but Let's go. Uh, I didn't see it in IMAX, so I got it in a yeah. weaker viewing ex viewing experience. Uh, I guess you Which, and you yeah. watched it in the way it was meant to, and I watched it on the equivalent no, mm. of an iPod shuffle. <laughs> sure. There's only 30 prints of it, or like 30 theaters uh, that are tr showing the true, um, like, 70 millimeter IMAX, which is at its point, I think, if you translate it into, like, a digital resolution... 17 uh, 70 millimeter IMAX is 18k <laughs> just like to put that into context and it's also like uh, still a, a I think a higher frame um even in the IMAX that, that they are showing it here there's sections that cut off like something I really don't like about IMAX and seeing films uh like for example Tenet that did have IMAX sequences is uh going back and forth between a more letterbox cut uh, cut to the IMAX cut. I think that is the most jarring thing you can do in movies. Uh, and this movie doesn't do it because it's completely shot on IMAX. And I think this is one of the few films, if not maybe the only film that was completely shot on IMAX. And that helps. It helps. Uh, it, it works better that way. Um, and I don't like the back and forth. So that was another thing that I really enjoyed. Like all of the technical sides, like the cinematography, the editing, even the sound mix in this, like in Tenet, uh, I remember it being atrocious. Rewatched it last night. It is horrible. In this film, I haven't experienced it on the home watch yet, but at least in my theater, I I was like blown away by how loud the explosions were, but it felt appropriate. Hmm. Yeah, one last debate that we could do is, uh, I guess, the CGI against the in-camera shots. I think there's like less than 30 people on the CGI team for this, and they did in the marketing um, mention that uh, these explosions are for real. Do you think that's something that added? to it or is it something that's like ultimately doesn't add up to anything substantial for the film overall there's one big moment with the explosion obviously and then there's yeah. i guess a few cut ins uh early on in the film with explosions happening so uh, yeah there's a lot of that. i think there's something special about the detail in in the film uh with the explosion that they recorded that just it just felt really really intense Mm. I can't tell you whether it's IMAX or whether it was just the experience. I didn't see it in IMAX. We don't have that here in, in Western Australia, but... Uh, did you have we, uh, Dolby Atmos, though? We, we do, but uh, unfortunately, yeah. the Dolby Atmos screening that night was actually for Barbie, not Oppenheimer. So ah, uh, okay. I didn't get Dolby Atmos, but I might go, I'm going to go rewatch it uh, with some other people uh, and in, hopefully, a Dolby Atmos screening just to see if there's any difference, yeah. really. But overall, the experience is great. I... I'm glad to see Christopher Nolan back on a, a higher horse. Uh, I don't think it is his best, yeah. but I think it's a solid biography. That's the thing. Uh, we got to remember it's a biopic. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is different to his other fictional films. There is a... It's so Citizen Kane. There is a realism <laughs> you know? to this film that, that feels yeah. different. And we obviously know that Nolan is great at making things feel realistic in a unbelievable world. So I think there's yeah. no one better to to represent the horrors, represent the I guess the I think horror is the best was word I could use really. Of, it of is the it animal. is almost like a horror film. Yeah, it, like I don't know if if you get like visceral uh, gut reactions when you watch horror films. I typically don't really get them. Maybe I I look off off screen or uh, like away from the screen. But this movie like made me almost like gag a couple of times just because it made me sick to my stomach. Just like not not as sick to my stomach. Not not the stuff that happens. I feel like overall it's not like something that's incredibly harsh on what it shows you. 
but it's just hush on the implications just because they're so tied to the real world that we still live in and to see that like unfold in a dramatic way is is really emotionally engaging i, I wouldn't fully put that onto like nolan to to deliver that it's just like also the story that he tells that is that is so like you know horrifying um but i i was completely entranced in the whole film and like what adds to it is just that Killian Murphy is killing it. Mm. He's he's so great in it. And he gets so many sequences when he's like filling up the whole frame in a close-up and you can read his face. And it's hard to read the character as well. It doesn't give you a definitive reading of it. And it just makes it of him. And it makes him just so intriguing and so interesting. I think he's a stand-up performance by a long shot. So yeah, uh, Lachlan, what's your rating for uh, Oppenheimer? So I gave Oppenheimer out of five because I'm rating it on the letterbox scale, a yes. four and a, a half. A four, okay. Four and a half, okay. So we're in the same track here. I also gave it a four and a half. I think it's an excellent film, one of this year's uh, best films, and certainly one that stands uh, pretty well in the rest of Nolan's filmography. And uh, like you said, you're going to be re-watching it soon. Um, I probably will as well. It's uh, one that... Uh, offers a lot, uh, but I mean, when it first came out of it, I, I told Kelly, I, I don't know if I ever want to see this film again. It like shook me, <laughs> literally, because it was so loud. Uh, seats were actually shaking, but also emotionally. Uh, but let us know what you thought of Oppenheimer in the comments below. And then also don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. We do these reviews. We did uh, a recent Nolan bracket where we decided what the best Nolan film of all time is. We had lots of arguments there because there's a lot of films that could be argued, you know, are the best. Um, <laughs> and we also got a weekly podcast right over here. So uh, yeah, subscribe. So thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you soon.